So we're looking at number 15 in chapter 8 in Sapling, or at least someone's 15. Um, it's an aromaticity question. So the first example they show is this. And the question asks for the number of, a, of pi electrons, right? Number of pi electrons, or electrons in the pi system, really, right? Number of electrons in the pi system. So how many electrons are in the pi system here? Six, right? So we have one, two, three, four, five, six. So six. And then the question is, is it aromatic, non-aromatic, or anti-aromatic? So we've got to harken back to our rules uh, for aromaticity, right? The first is the uninterrupted... Pi system in a ring. Right, it has to be in a ring. And the second one was an odd number of pairs of electrons in the pi system. Right? So in this case, is there an uninterrupted pi system in a ring? Yeah. There is, right? So don't be confused, right? Yeah, this ring is here, but this ring, this ring still is uninterrupted, right? This ring's not, this part, of the, this part of the molecule is not aromatic, right? So the whole molecule is not aromatic, but parts of the molecule can be aromatic, right? So this part of the molecule is aromatic. So this is an aromatic molecule, right? So aromatic, aromatic. Right. Got an uninterrupted pi system, sp2, 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 pi electrons, and there's an odd number of pairs of those pi electrons, aromatic. So the other one they have, it's a little different. All right, so the number of pi electrons, how many do we have here? We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So we got ten. Right, notice, right, is this an uninterrupted pi system? All right, are there, are there any sp3 carbons? Nope. sp2, 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 sp2. So it's all one pi system, right? It's all lined up. And so there's 10. How many pairs? So if there's 10 electrons, how many pairs does that make? Five. Is five an odd number? Yeah, it is. So this, in this case, this whole molecule is aromatic, whereas up here, just this portion is aromatic. So for like the, the top one, like let's say there is a, a pi bond in between like one of those carbons. There's a pi bond over here, over here. Yeah. It's still mm -hmm. aromatic. So that part is... This part is still aromatic, yeah, absolutely. Yep. But the other part wouldn't... The other part is not. No. Good question, right? So aromaticity. But right. with that pi bond that would be there, whatever, on the mm -hmm. other part, would that not be part of the so that, pi system then? So it starts to get a little tricky, right? Remember we talked about aromaticity is not like a, an, being anti-aromatic, right, or non-aromatic. It's, it's not a... It's a very... It can be gray. The area can be gray, right? Like just like bonds, right? What's a bond, right? At what point does a bond no longer? What, at what point is something a covalent bond versus ionic bond? What, like, do you know the exact point? No. So we don't really know the exact point where, right? How aromatic something is, or how non-aromatic or anti-aromatic something is, right? So just we won't give you too many weird exceptions, right? We're really looking for an uninterrupted pi system and odd number of pairs of electrons. Make sense? So that other pi bond wouldn't be... No, it would be... It? It, it could. Yes, it could. But it's still aromatic. Right? So, now we're on the, since we're on the subject of aromaticity, let's look at some anti-aromatic compounds. Right? So, same rules for aromatic. This is the first one. An uninterrupted pi system. Right? An uninterrupted pi system in a ring. Uninterrupted pi system in a ring. But the second rule, now we want an even number 
of pairs of electrons in the pi system, right? So we still want an uninterrupted pi system in a ring, but now we want an even number of pairs. So things that are anti-aromatic, this guy is anti-aromatic, right? That guy is anti-aromatic. Um, No, I'm not going to do that. So, uninterrupted pi system in a ring, but even numbers of pairs of electrons. Right? And so I guess one example we talked about in class was the cyclooctatetraene. So now this one, you look at this and you say, right, is, there an uninterrupted, is it an uninterrupted pi system? Yeah. Yep. How many pairs of electrons are in the pi system? Four pairs, right? So you'd say this is anti-aromatic. But actually, right, this guy puckers. It essentially, instead of being flat, right, because it had, if, we, if you're in a pi system, you have to be fl flat. What this will do, it'll pucker, right? It'll kind of essentially, it'll bend, right? So these pi bonds aren't all lined up. It kind of puckers itself. So it doesn't want, right, it doesn't want to be anti-aromatic, right? So, I mean, you could call it anti-aromatic or you call it non-aromatic. That's kind of that sliding scale. Like, this molecule is making a choice, right? It's like, well, I don't want to be anti-aromatic. I'm going to, I'm going to shift my bonds a little bit so I'm not, I don't have, a, I don't have an uninterrupted pi system anymore, right? So it puckers. Once it puckers, it's not flat. So it no longer has that uninterrupted pi system. So, like, so really, this is, really, this is at the edge, right? This is really non aromatic because it really isn't flat because it really isn't flat and while these guys are both anti they don't they don't really have that flexibility right notice the ring is an eight member ring so it's more flexibility there versus a four and a three member ring but once it gets over like once it gets over once it gets over six yeah then you can really start doing moving around where different ways all right kind of a another aromaticity question kind of a beast of a molecule number 16 in chapter eight uh this one now includes an alkyne. So you know, if you've noticed, when we've been saying this, we've been very careful about what we say, right? An uninterrupted pi system. Do carbons that are sp hybridized have pi have pi bonds and p orbitals? Yes, they do. They have two of them, right? So don't forget though, those pi bonds are perpendicular to each other, right? So on an alkyne, only one of the pi bonds can be part of the pi system, right? In an alkyne, only one of the pi bonds can be part of the pi system. So let's draw one. So it's an alkyne, a couple of alkenes coming off it. There she is. Right? So the rules still apply. Right? They're going to ask us how many, what are the number of pi electrons? How many pi electrons are there? Not pi electrons in the ring, delocalized in the pi system. How many pi electrons are there? So they're asking for you the number of pi electrons. Let's count them up. Right? One and two. Three, four. Five, six. Seven, eight. Nine, ten. Eleven, twelve. Thirteen, fourteen. And now they just want pi electrons. 15, 16. Pi electrons. They didn't say about pi electrons in the pi system. They said pi electrons. All right, so how many electrons are in pi bonds? Now, if you look at this, what I did here, if, you, if somebody asks you how many electrons are in the pi system, right? how many are delocalized in the ring? Those are the blue ones. Right? So don't forget, an alkyne right, has two pi bonds, right? There's one. And there's the other. Notice, what's the angle from here to here? 
between these two pi bonds and an alkyne, what's the angle? Got to know those geometries, guys. What's that angle? No? 90. Right? Right? The two pi bonds are perpendicular to each other. Right? So when they ask you how many pi electrons are in the delocalized, right? It's only the only one of these can be, right? Because the other one's 90 degrees away. So it's not there's 16 there's 16 pi electrons, but only 14 are delocalized in the ring and are part of the pi system. Because the other ones are sticking out, right? The red ones here are sticking out 90 degrees away. So they're not lined up, right? To do the to do the the resonance structures and move electrons around, everybody has to be lined up together. So these guys are not lined up. So we yeah, so we've taken the whole time now, right? Everybody's probably convinced, right? There's 16 pi electrons, but only 14 of them are in the ring pi system. So is this compound aromatic? If it's 14 electrons in the pi system, how many pairs is that? Seven. Seven. So this molecule then is aromatic. Yeah, odd number of pairs. So looking at number two, which now we're going to start shifting. I mean, we're going to start shifting away from aromat aromaticity stuff and to resonance contributors. So one of them, if I draw it out, they're starting with da, da, an isocyanide is what this is called. All right, I think they ask you to include the lone pairs, right? So now you got remember like this is chapter one stuff, right? How many bonds does oxygen want to make, right? Everybody wants to have a full octet. How many lone pairs? If oxygen has two bonds, how many lone pairs does it have? Four lone pairs. Yep, two pairs. Right? If carbon has four bonds, it's happy. If nitrogen has three bonds, how many lone pairs does it have? One lone pair. Very good. And they're asking us, it says, draw the predominant resonance contributor for the following compound. Include lone pairs, formal charges, and hydrogen atoms. Right? Add curved arrows to both to show the delocalization of electron pairs. So are there any formal charges on this first isocyanate? Is everybody happy? Yeah. Everyone's happy. Yeah, I think so. Now, the hard part here is, right, which one, whose electron should I move? Right? So who has a lone pair? Nitrogen and oxygen. Right? Who's more willing to let go of their lone pair? Nitrogen. Nitrogen. Right? All this stuff comes back to the end of the day. All these resonance structures, all this stuff is, do you have electronegativity? I told you, that's all organic chemistry is at the end of the day. Somebody has electrons, somebody wants them. We're just moving them around. Right? So nitrogen is more willing to let them go. So let's have nitrogen move them. And right, oxygen is really electronegative anyways. Right? So let's, give, let's, give, let's push electrons towards oxygen. So this lone pair goes here. Right? I can't... I can't skip, right? I can only go one bond over, right? Don't try to take the lone pair, right? I'm going to see this. Somebody's going to take the lone pair and try to drop it over here. I know. It doesn't make any sense. But, right? but if I make this bond right here, right? if I push electrons through this carbon, how many bonds does carbon want to have? Four. If I'm making a new bond, i got to break a bond, right? So I take the, this pi bond breaks... And now it goes to that oxygen. Those electrons, that two electrons in that bond go to that oxygen. <coughs> so now, where is there, what do I have for new bonds? I have two pi bonds between that nitrogen and carbon. And I, I should have three lone pairs on that oxygen now, right? And a negative charge there. So I have a negative charge. Overall, I started with what kind of, I had no overall charge. So if I have a negative charge, I have to have a plus charge somewhere, right? So where should I put the plus charge? Nitro, right, nitrogen, right, it makes sense. Nitrogen gave up electrons. It's sharing electrons now. So let's put the plus charge on the nitrogen. Good. Now they want us to go backwards. What are the arrows going to look like going the other direction? Just the exact opposite, right? So then... Now this lone pair goes there, and this pi bond breaks and goes back to the nitrogen. Right? Notice it doesn't matter what lone pair I pick. You can't label electrons. Yeah. I just have a trouble understanding why it would go 
Good question, right? So then the other question should be, which resonance stru which structure is the most likely structure? The, the one here, the, the, if I call this, what's the most likely structure, A or B? Which one do you think is most likely? A or B? A. Why A? No, more stable because it has no charge. Right, so everybody wants the octet rule, right? Octet rule is the first and foremost. But if you look, right, does everybody have a full octet here? Does everybody have a full octet here? Yes, they do. Everybody does have a full octet. All right, this nitrogen still has one, two, three, four bonds. So it has eight electrons around it. And this oxygen still has eight electrons around it, and so does this carbon. So everybody still has a full octet. So if every, the octet rule is satisfied, then it goes back to basics, right? Do we want to have charges? No. And like the number of bonds each atom actually And you might as well, yeah, you might as well make everybody happy, right? So if you obey the octet rule, then it's all about right, not having charges. Let's look at number number nine, chapter eight. Now this one, this is where this is where it starts to get tricky in sampling. They really gotta be careful of those adding your lone pairs and your charges. Right. I think it starts out like this. I think they probably draw, I think they drew the electrons in probably there. And then drew a sulfur. Like this. And the first thing they're going to ask you, they're going to say, fill in the formal charges. Right? Fill in the formal charges. They already have the electrons. I think it already had the electrons on there. It didn't? It didn't? No. Okay. Well, then what's the first rule of those dot structures? Octet. Octet. It makes sure it has eight electrons around them. Right? So if these... If these electrons weren't there, you just keep adding lone pairs until you get to eight. And this carbon has three bonds. You just keep adding, you add a lone pair, so it has eight electrons around it. Okay, so we're good there. Now we gotta do formal charges though, right? So how many bonds does sulfur wanna have usually? Where is sulfur at in the periodic table? It wants two. Right, it's below oxygen, and so oxygen wants two bonds, so sulfur also wants two bonds. So it has an extra set of electrons, so it's gonna be negative. Carbon wants four bonds. Carbon has an extra electron pair. So carbon's also going to have a negative charge. All right? So that's one resonance contributor. So it's overall negative two? Oh, not, oh, not done. Nitrogen. Not done yet. All right? So yeah, you should, be, you should always be cautious. If you see something that's overall negative two with a carbon, it's kind of weird, right? You maybe saw some stuff in, or, in inorganic or gen chem where you had like NO3 with minuses, two minuses, things like that. But usually, in generally, in organic chemistry, we don't have things that are 2 minus or 2 plus, very, very rarely. So if you see 2 minus, you should say, oh, wait a second, this might not be right. So nitrogen, right, should have a plus charge because nitrogen has four bonds and really wants only three. Good. So this is the first resonance contributor. And they want us to draw two other ones. Right, so it's, it's, we're not doing reactions, but again, where do you always start your arrows at? Where should you start arrows at? Electron density. So you have two places here, the sulfur and the carbon that are both pretty electron dense. So you should, maybe one resonance contributor, you're going to start with the arrows from there, and the other resonance contributor will start with the arrows from the other side. All right, so let's do the, on the in the red, I'll do the uh, carbon. So these electrons go towards the nitrogen. But nitrogen doesn't want to have five bonds. Right? So I gotta break this bond at the same time. Right? Makes sense? So the resonance structure in this case. We gotta make sure we balance our charge, of course. So sulfur doesn't change, the sulfur still has a negative charge. And I know overall I have to be negative. The oxygen got electrons, right? It had two lone pairs. I should have drawn these lone pairs in probably two. A sapling would have dinged me. So there should be a minus in the oxygen. And the nitrogen still has four bonds. The nitrogen still has a plus charge. Good. 
Silver, silver didn't change at all. Silver didn't change at all. Then arrows weren't anywhere near. Silver was just long for the ride. Now, for the sake of clarity, I'm going to redraw this. Right? I don't, I don't, I don't, it's not good practice to draw two sets of arrows on the same thing going two different directions. All right, so now let's have the sulfur electrons move towards the nitrogen. Electrons go up to the oxygen. Again, the carbon didn't change at all, just along for the ride. Had nothing to do with anything. New pi bond between sulfur and nitrogen. We broke a pi bond between oxygen and nitrogen, that, those two electrons end up on the oxygen, so there should be a negative charge there. And nitrogen still has four bonds, so it has a plus charge still. Okay. So then now we have these three resonance contributors. So let's, I'll, I'll label them. Let's see, this is A, right? And this is also A. We'll call this one C and this one B. So what's the same in all of them? Nitrogen is a plus charge. So that's, that's a wash. What's different in some of them? Oxygen and sulfur both have a negative charge. Yep, so who has the negative charge? Oxygen, sulfur, or carbon? Who do you think, who do you think we least care about having the negative charge? Oxygen. Who do you think wants to have the negative charge? Oxygen and sulfur. Oxygen and sulfur on the negative charge, right? Why? Why do, oxygen, why do you think oxygen and sulfur are more likely to have the negative charge? They're more electronegative than carbon. carbon, right? So why should carbon have a negative charge? So the best uh, resonance contributor is going to be which one? B. B. Right, again, right, chapter one stuff, electronegativity. Who'd rather have the negative charge? Right, so we're supplying those ideas all over again in a different way. Okay, so retrosynthetic problem. First thing we ask ourselves, do we add any carbons? Yes, we did. We added carbons. All right, so let's number the carbons in the starting material, one and two, and find those one and two in the product. Right. Again, basically where the stuff got added, that's where the alkyne is going to be at, because that's kind of what, where it goes. I'll call this three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So we've added one, two, three, four, five, six, seven carbons. We're adding seven carbons to this. Right? We start with two C's, we're adding seven. We're going to add seven. All right? So now we want to work backwards, though, right? It's too hard to say what happened. So if we work backwards one step, we take a look at what's going on here. We actually have an option. We have a choice here. So we see a bromine and a bromine. Are they cis or trans to each other? They're trans to each other. And we see a chlorine and an O, an ether, an OCH3. They're also trans to each other. Right? Okay. So which one do you want to work with? The bromine, the trans bromines, or the chlorine and the, the ether? doesn't really matter. You can do it either way. So the bromines. So what alkene... Did those Br2s add, that bromine add to? Those two bromines, what alkene did it add to? So I'm going to, we should know it's an alkene. I gave that away. Right. If you want to get bromines on there, you need to have a pi bond, right? So let's say there's a pi bond now. The pi bond between 1 and 2, right? What's off the pi bond still? What's off carbon 1 still? The ether is? So I'll put the ether here. So if I put the ether there, <coughs> is the ether cis or trans to the chlorine? Is the ether on the same side of the double bond as the chlorine or the opposite side? Should be trans, right? Notice, right? 
it's wedge is going away here, and this is coming out. They're trans to each other here. They had to be trans to each other in the starting material too. Now, don't forget to fill in the rest, right? Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, right? Good. So now we have an ether and a chlorine trans to each other. What star material did that come from? What kind of star material did that come from? If you want to add a Cl and an ether, what kind of star material did that come from? And they come from an alkyne, right? And the alkyne is going to be between which two carbons? One and two. So you draw that first. You got to be careful with our bond angles here. So this would be three. And three is bonded to four and five. Be careful with those bond angles. Are you getting rid of oxygen as well, though? Yep. I know they're trans, right? So if I want to add a OCH3 and a chlorine, what kind of star material would that be from? An alkyne. I'm not talking about the reagents yet. I'm just working. Okay. This is the star material. On the table, you want to have more reagents. In oh, yeah. We'd want the whole thing. Yep. Yep. We may have fill in the boxes where there's blanks where you fill in both, dire go in both directions, maybe. I'll, and I'll post the old test too tonight. So two is bonded to six, right? Be careful of our bond angles again. Right? Don't add carbons that aren't there. I don't want to see any wonky bond angles coming off the alkyne. Seven, eight, nine. Okay. Oops. Eight, eight. Now we're back to the alkyne. So once we get to this point, this is where we can start adding carbons, right? The one way we know how to add carbons. So it doesn't matter which, again, it doesn't matter which one we do first. Which, which, bond, which bond do you want to break first? And which bonds are we going to have to break? Three and one and? Right? This is the bond we're going to make, and this is the bond we're going to make, right? So let's break three and one first. So the starting material that was used to make the bond between three and one is this, where that's an H now. One, two, Six, seven, eight, nine. What else do I have to have in there? I have to have, well, right, four, three, and five. But where is the brome? Where do I need to make which carbon delta plus? Because I'm going to use, right, I'm going to use a strong base to deprotonate this and make this a negative charge. Which carbon needs to be delta plus? Carbon three. So I need to put what on carbon three? Let's put a bromine on carbon three. This is where we, yep, yep. So I like to do one thing at a time. I like to do the backwards work before I start worrying about the forward stuff. Do you just have that molecule in a jar or something that is three carbon? Yeah, you could buy that, yeah. Absolutely, you could just buy it, yep. So I'm, unless we set restrictions on you, right, and say you can only use three carbon, maximum three carbon pieces. We're not quite to that point yet, or we do that to you. But we can get there. All right, so at this point, you can just make up bromine pieces, essentially. Next, so we, we added one carbon piece, now we need to add the other one. So again, working back from this guy, which bond do we need to break here again? Two and six, right? And that gets us all the way back to, heck, gets us all the way back to there. And what piece do we need to add in? So we need to add six, seven, eight. So it's six, seven, eight, nine. And which carbon do we need to make delta plus? Carbon six. So what do we, what do we want to put on six? Bromine. Bromine. So like for that, should we, um, do you want us to like put it next to the alkyne or should we just put it on, you know, it's like one and then so yeah, so that yep. So now let's now we'll, now let's talk about how we want to do the forward synthesis, right? So how do we make sure we do this the right way? So what reagents, right? So it's a, it's a stepwise thing. For first set of reagents going back this way now, 
Step one, we need to add in what? There's two choices. So the first step here, what do you need to add in? NaNH2. You could add in NaNH2, which is a strong base, right, which will depronate terminal alkyne, make that a nucleophile. And then this, once I do that, then step two, I will add in my electrophile. Step one, you got to deprotonate. Step two, you add in the electrophile. So you got to say step two. So that made the carbon bond between two and six. Now if we go back this way, again, what do we need to use? What, let's use a different reagent this time. What other thing can we use to deprotonate the alkyne? What other thing can we use? Butyl the butyllithium. So step one, right, the butyl lithium. And then step two would have to be, right, we'll just say it's this. Give a little circle there. It says step two. Right, it does matter, right? Because if I added in, if I added in this with this, these two would react with each other, right? This carbon would attack that carbon, and that'd be a mess, right? We want this carbon to attack that carbon. So we gotta get this base to depronate this carbon, make this the nucleophile, so carbon one can attack carbon three. So now we've made that carbon carbon bond. We march along here. What reagents do we need to turn an alkyne into a trans chloride ether? What reagents do we need? We want to add one chlorine and, and also an OCH3, and trans. Trans. case, again, I want OCH3 and Cl trans. If, it was, if I wanted just an H and a Cl trans, I'd just use HCl. Mm -hmm. But since I want something besides H here, I need to use Cl2, and the solvent needs to be CH3OH. Alright? So that's the solvent. Oh, solvent. Solvent, yep, this is the solvent. Solvent. Oh, right? Because how many carbons are off this ether? Oh. Just the one. Oh. Right? This carbon right here is this carbon here. Yep. Good. Everybody see how that would be trans? You have to go through a chloronium ion again? Right? And trans attack. Oh, yeah, because this, there's more of this. Um, solvent around. Solvent. Yep. Solvent's always going to be, right? Look, for that, look out for that solvent. Right? It's going to react. Last step, you have an alkene, you want to get two bromines trans to each other, what reagents do you use? Just two bromines? Just Br2 by itself, right? That gets two bromines trans to each other with an alkene. Right, so you got to be, I mean, yeah. Don't forget what you know, right? If you just saw an alkene without any of this other stuff, you, you know to put Br2 to get bromines trans, right? Trying to get past the other extra stuff.